All this is Dr. Mobin Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. Today, I wanted to go over the FDA approved EUA, emergency use authorized drug, not exactly approved, uh, BAM Lanivimab. So that is a drug by Eli Lilly. And let's look at what it is and how does it work. So let's start. <clears throat> So first of all, let's look at some of the uh, links. So this is drbean.com. This is a video of mine where I had discussed in detail how a recombinant uh, antibody is made. In this video, I have also discussed how a monoclonal antibody is made. So for a deeper dive into how these antibodies are made i would i have put the link to this uh, video out there in the description as well so <clears throat> my request will be that you look at that uh, video as well now here is a list of the approved medications or therapies by fda let's very quickly look at the uh, list here so 12 18 so december 18 moderna vaccine was approved December 11, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine was approved. And somebody had left a comment uh, under my video yesterday that uh, because I do not like AstraZeneca, that may be because it is UK-based and I like US-based. Um, that is not the case. Al although uh, I am in the US, I'm a US citizen, I love things that are from here. So that is not a problem. But uh, Pfizer-BioNTech, I really like it. And BioNTech is actually a German company. My reason for AstraZeneca's uh, um, concern is only their trial data. And I am not comfortable with that data. And they are starting their um, trial, they, or they, are, they have their trial going on, I believe, in the US at this time. So once the data comes out from there, we'll form more opinion. Although there is some more data coming out from Pfizer and others, that is not that great either. So we'll see. But it is not about US and UK. Uh, then here is this Casirivimab. And this is the Regeneron. This was approved on 1121, which is a good thing. I love Regeneron. That is a polyclonal antibody. This is 1119, so November 19. This is baricitinib and remdesivir. And we know this from a long time, that these were the ones that were uh, being requested. Remdesivir is a antiviral. Remember, it creates the raw material, or it, it mimics the raw material for the viral RNA. But this raw material is really fake bricks. So when the virus is made up of these bricks, it doesn't work very well. And the baricitinib is another uh, immune system regulator. I believe it is a JAG stat re regulator. And here is the BAM lanivimab. <laughs> and if you just heard the sound, this is Kyrie playing with her ball. So this is um, November 9th, BAM uh, lanivimab. And we'll talk about this. Then they have convalescent plasma that is approved. They have this. Uh, Regicot, which is to be a solution to keep people um, for the re renal replacement therapy, and so on. So there are a bunch of other drugs as well. Some of those are just to keep person sedated. Some are uh, fluid replacements. Some are um, the monoclonal antibodies. So in all of these, BAM leniv lenivimab is what we'll talk about today. So here, let's start. And the links for this one, this is FDA's uh, approved therapies. This is FDA's news release about the BAM lanivimab and why they have approved it and what are the things that they've seen here. This is Eli Lilly's own or Lilly's own uh, message about the BAM lanivimab. So we'll look at that. Then here, this is a very interesting article although it is by Motif, which is in the business of making antibodies, so it's a commercial company, I have no um, 
relationship with them, but the article is really good. Here, what they're talking about is what are antibodies, what are monoclonal antibodies, polyclonal antibodies, recombinant antibodies. Lily's antibody that we're talking about today is a is a recombinant antibodies. So they have talked about all of those antibodies and how they are formed. And yes, llamas are involved and sharks are involved and so on. So this is an interesting article. Then hybridomas, we have talked about hybridomas in the past. And finally, this is the NIH site. And here, what I wanted to keep it here for is the criteria for bam lenivimab so that is the background and the links, and now let's start our discussion. The drug was approved on 11.9. This is a neutralizing antibody. It is a recombinant neutralizing antibody, and I'll explain in a second what does that mean. But the antibody is prepared in a lab, and it is going to coat the spike protein of the virus, and that is how it is neutralizing. The name of the antibody is LY for Lily, COV555. <laughs> very, very genius name, 555. Uh, company Eli Lilly. Availability. So, US has a contract with Lilly for 300,000 doses for high risk patients. And we'll talk about the high risk patient in a second. Dose 700 milligram intravenous infusion. So, it is given in the blood as an infusion, one dose of 700 milligram. Eligibility. So we'll look into this eligibility in a little more detail. Trial, the result of which actually enabled this approval, that was Blaze 1 trial. There is interim analysis from phase two. That was the basis for the approval. So now let's look at the Blaze trial itself, the higher overview. Total patients in this trial were 465. And once again, it is a interim analysis. The things that they were observing after giving this um, antibody was number one, at day 11, will the viral load reduce in the patient who is given this drug versus placebo? That is one. Second, they wanted to see if giving this anti <coughs> excuse me antibody reduced hospital visits now please remember this drug is not for hospitalized patients they actually observed that those patients who are already in the hospital it actually causes worst outcomes and those who are on ventilator or they need high flow oxygen their outcome with this are also worst. So it is actually contraindicated for hospitalized patients. It is a drug for outpatient, and there is a strict criteria for that as well. So when they ran this trial, they have 101 patients who are receiving 700 milligram of the, the BAM lenivimab. Another 107 received 2,800 milligram infusion. Another 101 received 7,000 milligrams with different doses. And then 156 patients were in placebo. For, for me, something that is interesting is that um, companies like um, Cytrodyne and Lironlimab, they could not get the traction which was taken by high profile companies or big pharmas. Look at the number of patients here, 465, and the, and the arms are small as well. And the results you would see are interesting, but they're not, they're not gonna blow your socks off. Even then, they have it approved. So look at this. So day 11, viral load. And they found out that the viral load difference in people with the bamlanivimab versus placebo was no difference. However, hospitalizations within 28 days of giving the dose, 3% on the high risk side, which were receiving the drug versus 10% in placebo. 
सो दैट इज द बेसिक इफेक्ट दैट इज द बेसिक डिफरेंस on the basis of this difference this drug is approved now let's look at what do they mean by high risk patients so once again outpatient drug that means given at home or given in the clinic not in the hospital if a person is hospitalized and this is not the drug for that person so given at home or in the clinic or in the outpatient uh, setting but to the high high risk so who are the high risk patient number 1 those patients or people of who have covid greater than 12 years of age and obese bmi greater than 35 equal or greater or have so children or they have diabetes or they have chronic kidney disease or they are immunocompromised or they are being actively immunosuppressed for example for chemotherapy and so on so children 12 years and older with these criteria can be given bamlanivimab 65 years and older once again i'll keep repeating the interesting thing about this drug is it is an outpatient drug it is a drug given at the outpatient and not in the hospitalized which is an interesting thing so 65 years and older folks who have cardiovascular issues or have hypertension or have chronic pulmonary diseases like copd chronic obstructive pulmonary disease then once again children teenagers plus children 12 years to 17 years of age bmi greater than 85% of what it should be according to the us's criteria or they have neurodevelopmental issues or they have congenital heart issues or acquired heart disease again we're talking about 12 to 17 years of age or they have sickle cell disease or they have some medical technology being used for their other treatments for example they have tracheostomy again not related to covid tracheostomy for something else or they have gastrostomy for something else remember if a patient of covid is in this severe state that they need tracheostomy or they are ventilated then bamlanivimab is actually contraindicated they have seen it to be harmful instead of uh, beneficial so these medical technology usages have to be by for other diseases so tracheostomy gastrostomy so that is the gastric or the stomach that is uh, rejected or partially rejected and then um, ppv then here um asthma chronic chronic diseases asthma chronic respiratory diseases for and for example those diseases respiratory diseases for which the child or teenager is taking daily medicines so these are the um these are the risk high risk patients these patients can be given bamlanivimab now let's look at the results they feel and i'm going to show it to you as well here um let's look at the what was i going to show you the results so here <laughs> here if you see here they say 12 years of age and older weighing at least 40 kilograms about 88 pounds and who are at high risk of progressive severe covid-19 disease or hospitalization and here if you see here um we talked about this i was going to show you the results here patients treated with bamlanivimab showed reduced viral load and rates of symptoms and hospitalization although in the fda fda they don't say that the viral load was reduced but anyways lily says viral load was reduced number 1 number 2 the rate of symptoms that means how many how many symptoms and how severe that was reduced 
and hospitalization was reduced. Again, 3% in the people who are treated with the drug versus 10% in placebo for hospitalization or hospital visit. The other interesting thing is that all doses, 700 milligram or 2800 milligram or 7000 milligram, all doses had similar effect. So they chose the smallest dose. So look at this. They say that Blaze 1 data shows that when bamblanivimab was given early in the disease course, may help patient clear the virus and reduce COVID-related hospitalizations, supporting our belief that neutralizing antibodies can be important therapeutic options for the patients. Good, we, we know that. It is not authorized for patients who are already hospitalized or who are on the ventilator or who require oxygen at high flow. Again, hospitalized patients. Now, final. So this is about the BAM-Lanivimab. I don't want to talk about a patient, but I think it is it is a public knowledge. I um, read that on Twitter. So maybe I can venture out and say it. Dr. Drew was given bamlanivimab as well. And um, I have been uh, staying in touch with him. Uh, even today, I was talking with him uh, via Twitter. So he was given bamlanivimab and he, of course, stayed at home, did not have to go to hospital, and uh, re recovered better with this. Now, how is a recombinant antibody made? So in this quick discussion, because I've done a separate video and I've discussed it, in this quick discussion, we will talk about what is a monoclonal antibody versus a polyclonal antibody versus a recombinant antibody. So that I'm going to just very quickly provide a refresher. So let's say we want to make an antibody against the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2. So what we do is we take an animal, maybe a mouse or a rabbit or a camel, or, no, sorry, horse or llama or shark and so on. There's a bunch of animals that are selected. Animal is given the antigen for which we want the antibodies to be produced. So here, let's say this uh, rabbit is given the spike protein. So when the spike protein is given, they would have a similar behavior like we do, and that is the cells are going to pick up this the antigen, they are going to present it to their immune system, and then the uh, adaptive arm will start becoming active, and humoral part of that will start making antibodies. In the humoral part, we know that B cells will become active. Correct, And so active B cells are called plasma cells. So now the animal has the plasma cell. And of course, these plasma cells in that animal are now secreting antibodies that are found in the blood of the animal as well. So from here, there are a few approaches that can be done. Number one, you can take this animal's blood and extract the antibodies from it. So that means you're using the animal directly as a manufacturing unit. And if that is the case, then normally bigger animals are used so that they can manufacture more and more antibodies at a faster rate. For example, horses. That is one possibility. And the antibody that will be extracted from their serum. This is just like convalescent serum from a human being, which is given to another person. Imagine we are taking convalescent serum, but we cannot just take horse's serum and inject it in a human because that would cause reaction. So we just take the antibodies out of it. The second possibility is to take the B cells that are active in the animal and remove them or take them out. So take a biopsy of the lymph node and take the B cells out. So here you're not bleeding the animal. You are actually taking the cells that are making the antibodies and bringing the cells out. Once you take those cells out, so let me just show it here. This is the model where you have a lots of animals now that were given the antigens and they were making antibodies and you're collecting those antibodies from the blood. And so you bleed them, you collect their blood, then you take the antibodies out and you collect those antibodies and you pack them up and that's it. 
they, there are uh, possibilities of reactions in those. So this is not the best way. But anyways, this is a way. Then we also know that you can take the plasma cell from the animal. Now, please remember that one B cell can only make one kind of antibody. So imagine an antibody is, we, we have talked about the antibodies in the past. So let's say this is an antibody, correct? So the antibodies have a an area where they bind with the antigen, correct? So that is an area which is the variable part of the antibody. So for example, if I get infected with SARS-CoV-2 today, my body is going to make thousands of kinds of antibodies. These are all directed towards the SARS-CoV-2, but some of them are going to connect here on the SARS-CoV-2 and here and some on the spike protein and some on one part of the spike protein some on the other part of the spike protein and so on. Meaning it's not that all the antibodies that are manufactured by my cells, B cells, are all the same kind. They are same class, for example, they will be IgM in the beginning, then they will become IgG. And again, some cells would still be making IgM, others would be starting to make IgG, some would make IgA, some would make E and so on. However, the one individual B cell only makes an antibody that has a unique binding region which can bind to one part of the antigen. And other B cell will have, will make an antibody, will have, which will have a binding region that is of different shape. Again, that binding region will bind to the virus somewhere, but the shape is different. So some antibodies are binding here and some here and some here and so on. But one B cell can only generate an antibody with one shape. This is very important. That means if you take one B cell from a person or an animal that was infected, one B cell will only create one kind of antibody the shape, the binding shape will be one type. The, the structure, the wrench handle will be one type as well. That is why it is called monoclonal antibody. What are polyclonal antibodies? Polyclonal are that if you have infected someone, so for example, I became infected with SARS-CoV-2. <coughs> Excuse me. So now my I have tons of B cells now which are active and they're making antibodies against various parts of the SARS-CoV-2. Then these antibodies together are called polyclonal antibodies. So back here, what we do is we take a bunch of B cells from that animal. We cultivate them separately. We see the antibodies that they are producing. Then we test the antibody. So imagine every single cell is a wrench maker and they are making wrench in their own little uh, <laughs> petri dish in, the, in their own little lab. Microscopically, one cell is doing something. And then you take those wrenches out from there, the antibodies, and then you test them on the virus to see which wrench is neutralizing, which uh, antibody connects with the spike protein, which connects with some, something else. And so you select that B cell that has made an antibody that is neutralizing or goes to the target that you want it to go to. For, for example, in our case, receptor binding domain of the spike protein. You select that B cell. You say you are a winner. All the other B cells are losers. And then you make copies of this B cell. And then you ask this B cell to make more now, how do you make copies of this B cell? How do you increase this B cell? In our body, it gets increased automatically. That is called the process of proliferation. What happens is if you um, if you drop interleukin-5 on it, then B cells start dividing and increasing in number. But outside, you have to combine them with some other cells which will not die. And I have done that discussion in the other video. Here, very sim uh, simply, you take a B cell of interest that is making the antibodies that you want. Imagine how much work goes in to have millions of B cells and then choosing a B cell that you think is making antibody that is the right antibody. 
then you combine them with a cancer cell, myeloma cell. Myeloma cells are B cells that have become cancerous that would not die anymore and they would just live forever. You fuse them together. And to fuse them, a substance that we've been talking about for some time nowadays in Pfizer and Moderna's case, the polyethylene glycol. So what you do is you drop polyethylene glycol between the cells and it burns their cell membranes and fuses them. So when they're fused, this cell is called a hybridoma. It is a hybrid of two cells. And oma means it's a tumor kind of a cell. It is not a cancer. It is a benign tumor. It is a cell that's going to live forever. Now this cell can make antibodies forever. So you have now a bunch of hybridomas that are sitting in a petri dish and they're just churning out the antibodies of your interest. And you keep taking their supernatant. You keep taking just like bees make honey. These little bees, microscopic bees are going to make antibodies. And you take those antibodies and you put them in a, in a little packaging and that becomes a vaccine. So this is a monoclonal antibody. For a monoclonal antibody, we do something like this, hybridoma production. Or monoclonal antibodies can be taken directly from the animals as well. So that is how that works. Now let's look at the recombinant antibodies. The benefit of recombinant, so let me back up for one more second. The problem with the polyclonal antibodies or sort of convalescent plasma. Once again, we cannot give an animal's plasma to a human. It would cause reaction. But imagine you take animal's convalescent plasma and then take antibodies out of it. Do you know the problem with these antibodies is the reproducibility? So you have 10 rabbits. You give them all spike proteins. They will all produce antibodies that are against the spike protein, but some of the rabbits will produce antibodies that are maybe on one side of the spike protein. Another rabbit would produce an antibody that is on another side of the spike protein. So they're not all going to pr produce 100% similar antibodies. Yes, these antibodies will be against the antigen, which is spike protein, but they would be slightly different from each other. That means between one batch to another batch, there is a difference. The antibodies are different. Some antibodies will work on some people and some antibodies will not work on other people. So you cannot have a consistency from one batch to next batch, from one animal to next animal. That is the same problem with monoclonal antibodies as well, which are produced in animals. Even when you have taken that monoclonal antibody, when you ask the animal to make more of those or you ask a different animal to make those antibodies, there are going to be small variations. So scaling up these antibodies and keeping them consistent in their structure is difficult. So what is the solution? Solution is very simple. Make recombinant antibodies. What is that? Take a B cell of your interest. A B cell, a plasma cell that is making antibodies that you want. For example, neutralizing antibodies in this case. Then Take the genetic material from it. Don't use the cell anymore now. Take the DNA from the cell that is making that specific antibody. Extract the DNA from the cell. Then, now of course this DNA that you've taken out is going to make an antibody that has tissue structure or tissue proteins that are for that animal that are compatible with that animal, but not for us. Then what you do is you replace majority of the DNA that is making this antibody, the recipe for the antibody you've taken from the animal. And now you're replacing the part of the recipe that makes the constant part of the antibody. So for example, here, and my other video would explain this in much more details. So what you do is you keep this part, the variable region, the genetic material, the recipe for the variable region that binds to the spike protein, you leave that intact from this B cell. But for the remaining part, the constant region of the antibody, you replace that with the DNA from the humans so that the remaining part of the antibody is produced, which looks like a human antibody. 
So when you give it to a human, it does not cause reaction. And I've discussed that. These are chimeric antibodies. So you take this DNA from the B cell. You then modify the DNA. The kind of modifications can be, number one, you replace the FC portion, the constant portion of the antibody from animal to human type. You can do further modifications to make sure that the antibody does not get destroyed fast enough. It stays sustained for some time. Its life is longer than other antibodies and so on. So you could create a bunch of modifications. Once those modifications are done in this new DNA, then what you do is you create a plasmid. Plasmid are small, tiny recipes that live in bacteria. And I have done this discussion in the other one. Just like human beings, what is our main difference from the other animals? That is that we learn and we share. That is what makes us human beings. They have done the uh, studies on uh, chimpanzee or gorilla children and human children. So initial two, three years of age, their development is actually very similar. They both behave very same. But there comes a time when human child can start learning from other children and from parents and from society and from teachers and primates children, non-human primates children, do not share that knowledge or they do not share that knowledge with each other. Here in bacteria, bacteria can have tiny DNA loops in them. These loops give them superpowers and they can actually share the copies of these loops with each other to say, for example, a bacteria might be found talking to another bacteria to say, hey, the penicillin is killing you. You don't like penicillin, right? It, it really bothers you. And the other one says, yeah, it really, really, it kills me. And this bacteria says, you know that I have found a plasmid. I have found a recipe which allows me to make a pump that when the penicillin enters my, my body, I can throw it out before it can kill me. This is like if you throw a hand grenade at someone and they pick it up and throw it back at you or somebody else or 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 the gas, what are those, the uh, tear gas. So bacteria can actually have those plasmids in them that give them superpowers against antibodies or, or other things. And they can share those plasmids with each other. We take advantage of this. And what we do is we take a plasmid from a bacteria. For example, here is a DNA loop of the bacteria. We cut that plasmid. We cut that loop and add this modified DNA that we manufactured to make the modified uh, uh, antibody. And we connect that here with this plasmid. Once we connect it, we inject that plasmid in a bacteria. Just like a cassette thing, you, you insert a CD drive in the bacteria. So here we have a small microscopic CD drive, and that is a plasmid. And that plasmid has been modified to make a spike, uh, sorry, antibody against a spike protein. So then you inject that little plasmid in the bacteria, and you start making copies of the bacteria. So imagine every bacteria is a tiny factory that can now make antibodies because it has a superpower of a plasmid, which is a recipe to make antibodies that we want. And now you just feed these bacteria and you put them in a lab and you say, Go, grow. And these bacteria would just make copies of themselves and keep growing. And in that process, their plasmids would keep expressing and they would make a lots of antibodies. And you just like honeybees once again, you just keep taking those antibodies out of them from the supernatant. The secretion is around the bacteria. You just keep taking it and you can fill up your vials and you have a, a vaccine. This is called a recombinant vaccine or a recombinant antibody. It does not include animal. It does not include manufacturing in the animal cells or animal bodies. Here we have taken a DNA, injected it into a yeast cell or a bacteria. So there are various kinds of cells. For example, yeast cells. Yeast cells are also used. 
And you do the same thing. You inject the modified DNA in them and the yeast cell would just keep secreting antibodies and you just take those antibodies. They're like little tiny microscopic bees that would make honey for us. So these yeast cells or E. coli bacteria or other bacteria can then make lots and lots of antibodies. We take them, we package them up and we sell them. And that is the recombinant antibody. What is the benefit of recombinant antibody? Look, <clears throat> because this DNA structure is constant, you have manufactured it, you have written the recipe. So every bacteria is going to make the exact same antibody. It's not going to be that one rabbit made the antibody that was different, slightly different from the other rabbit and then one mouse made it differently and other mouse made it differently and now one batch of the antibody is different from the other batch that's not happening you have the exact genetic material that you wanted and you have given that genetic material to a bacteria bacteria cannot change it it's only going to express it and make antibodies that are 100 percent same so number one the reproducibility of the antibody is reliable it's guaranteed Number two, the scale of production can be a lot. Number three, you are not bleeding animals and taking their serum and then extracting the antibodies from there. So this is why it is, this is the recomb recombinant simply means that we have recombined various parts of the DNA. So if I go back here for a second, this part here where you took this DNA, you took this DNA and then recombined it. That is why it is called recombinant and then it is made in bacteria or other cells. So this is the, this is the production. This is how Eli Lilly's antibody works. Let me just now look at a few questions here and then we can go from there. And uh, please like, subscribe and share. There is a link in the description for coffees if you wanted to buy me coffees. And there is another link in the description if you wanted to support the work that I'm doing. Okay, so let's see what are some questions here. We we have our, uh, our open forum tomorrow as well. So we'll discuss some more questions then too. Wow, Wayne has a very good question. How many types of B cells are there? Imagine one B cell can make only one kind of uh, antigen binding area. And we have millions and millions and millions and billions of antigens. So we have billions of anti, uh, B cells in us. Good question. Rajesh says, Rajesh says, it is a very heavy lecture today. Yet, doctor, you have made it easy to understand. Thank you very much. Um, TD says, question, Dr. Bean, any feedback from yesterday video from doctors? I have received so many doctors' messages that this is a very plausible hypothesis. They are very excited about it. This to those who have been using ivermectin and steroids, for them, it kind of makes sense. It kind of connects the dots a little more. Those who are not sold on ivermectin-like things anyways, they would just not care for this as well. So um, some of the folks were really, really um, appreciative. They thought that this was a breakthrough that might actually explain and help a lot further. <laughs> John, John says he looks Chinese but sounds Indian. I am actually Pakistani originally, but I'm a U.S. citizen. So, so I have Chinese face as well and Indian accent as well and Pakistani origin and U U.S. Uh, citizenship. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> diversity love. What if you want to have coffee with you? Class coffee hour. Absolutely. So I am actually hoping that once the pandemic is over, we're going to sit down in various cities and just have our little huddles. And, and if you guys remembered by that time, the cool beans, and we'll, we'll meet.
<laughs> Acoustic theory says, who said Chinese? They must not get out much. <laughs> France says it looks like a breakthrough to me. That that it is very interesting. And this actually tells me how important ivermectin is, which after the discussion yesterday and the, the whole day I kept thinking about it and how I kept visualizing the mechanisms and the pathologies and how the ivermectin is helping. So my conclusion after doing all the thinking yesterday was ivermectin must be given in addition to all other therapies. And steroids at some point must be given to calm down the macrophage and, uh, activation syndrome. And ADE behavior in uh, severe patients must be observed. So I think ivermectin is a very, not only it is something that is keeping the viral load low and that is keeping us safe, but it is actually very, very important, important partner with steroids. Meaning in the therapies for the COVID, ivermectin should not be missed as, hey, we have something else available, so let's not do ivermectin. <laughs> Janet says, any back for my... <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Jenna says, you can have my antibodies. I just want my health back. So Jenna, um, apologies for speculating, but I think I've uh, heard a few times from your comments here that you may be a long hauler. Um, what have you taken so far? Steroids, ivermectin, um, what is helping and what is not helping? Have you talked with Dr. Yo and Dr. Bruce Patterson as well? <laughs> Simple Garden says, my little brain is stuffed like an egg between tonight and last night's lecture. I'm so sorry. I'm trying to keep them easy and uh, uh, kind of uh, accessible. My apologies if it uh, still... Um... So Rajesh says, I love your talks. Thank you very much, Rajesh. <clears throat> Ellie says, uh, Ellie says, coffee with Dr. Bean. Thank you for your discussion and all of your uh, hard work. You're very welcome. So I think this is where we are. Uh, there is a question here from William. Question on yesterday's topic. I understand how bromhexine works to block CV19 using TMPRSS2. But yesterday you mentioned we should take bromhexine with the vaccine to avoid ADE. Can you explain? Yes. So remember one of the ADE mechanism was where the antibody works with the with the virus and creates a conformational change in the virus so that it becomes easy for the virus to fuse with the TMPRSS2 and the virus receptors and so on. So they are saying to prevent ADE, one important factor should be to add bromhexin so that even if the ADE mechanism number four and five are occurring, the bromhexin-like products are going to temper the TMPRSS2, and that mechanism will be defeated. That is why it was important. It was very interesting thought, actually. Good that you picked it up and you had the question. I was thinking that will somebody ask me that why do you use TMPRSS2 here or the bromhexin here? So good one, William. Wayne says, question for everyone. If getting vax is important on the level of an emergency, why don't vaccination centers in the cities stay open? Absolutely. I actually thought I actually thought they would have uh, centers everywhere on the roads to say, please come and get vaccinated. But unfortunately, here we are. <clears throat> Absolutely, Luffy agrees. Luffy has been running around here. Paul says, aren't steroids only needed by a few where ivermectin for all? That is correct. So ivermectin for all. And most of the time, people are going to become... Um, 
they're going to recover within five, 10 days time. And you would know that they are on the recovering side. However, if you see that somebody is taking ivermectin, even then they are actually declining or their oxygen saturation is going down, down. they're having breathing issues, or they have, uh, for example, um, FIO2 is changed, or their lungs are showing a lot of destruction, then at some point you have to give steroids to prevent the macrophage activation syndrome. V very good, uh, Paul, that yes, it's not necessary that they are always have to be given. Ivermectin always, steroids as needed. Samina says, I agree it to meet together. Absolutely. Uh, Samina, I'll come to Bangladesh as well. <laughs> France says, and how important Dr. Bean is, Sherlock Holmes. Um, thank you, France. So I think this is it. This is what we have for today. Um, Uh, Excalibur, John Deere, look, 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 look. Is it possible for COVID-19 variant becoming resistant to ivermectin? No. <laughs> so that is a fun thing. Very good question. Let me explain it with a, with a drawing. So check this out. I become so proud that cool beans have such great questions. That means that these about 260 videos plus another 10, 15 or more uh, question answers, about 270 topics together, studying together. We have all gotten so much of the information and knowledge that we can we can process such questions. So Excalibur, good question. So look, here is a cell. And here is the virus. Let's say here is the virus. Virus's job is to produce enzymes, messengers, which we say cargo. These are enzymes and messengers, proteins made by the virus. These cargos connect with our protein in our cell called important A and B. I call them donkey. They connect with this cargo of the virus and haul that cargo in a nucleus, in our nucleus, cell's nucleus. Then that cargo, once it is inside the cell nucleus, it goes to our DNA and asks the DNA not to be antiviral. For example, not to make tumor necrosis factor, not to release interferon uh, alpha and beta, and not to make uh, nitric oxide. Sorry, to make nitric oxide. So what happens is the result is the cell is not making t tumor necrosis factor, cell is not making interferon alpha, and the nearby cells are not becoming um, alerted. Plus this cell, the original cell, is not becoming strong. Ivermectin's job is that when ivermectin is present, I make ivermectin normally like this. This is the ivermectin man. When ivermectin hero is present, what it does is it blocks our donkey that is taking the cargo, cargo inside the cell. So it blocks our protein, important alpha and beta. It binds with them. And so now cell, the virus cannot sell, send its cargo in the nucleus. So imagine there is a car and that car is already occupied some, by some other passengers and you cannot sit in, in it anymore. That is the role of the ivermectin, one of the role, important role. This is not an antiviral load a role. It actually reduces the viral replication and viral propagation. Now imagine the virus decides that, you know what, this ivermectin dude is really bothering me. So I'm going to change and I'm going to mutate and I'm going to try to defeat this. Then the thing is this, there are, what are the kind of mutations that are needed? One, let's say the virus has to figure out how do I send my messenger in the nucleus without using importing alpha and beta? Maybe I find a new um, protein that can take my messages in. That kind of change in the virus will be very difficult because it's a very complex change to say, I don't want to use this protein. Instead, I want to use some other protein. 
So very difficult. Now, let's say there is another change that the virus decides, you know what? I'm not going to send my message anyways. Let's just forget about ivermectin. I am just not making this cargo anymore. So there is no cargo. There is no need to go into the nucleus. There is no ivermectin's effect. But the problem is if there is no cargo going into the nucleus and the virus is not being effective anymore. Third mechanism could be virus says, you know what? I'm going to start making an enzyme that is going to seek, that is going to find ivermectin in the cell. And if ivermectin is present, it's going to destroy it. That is a very complex change as well. To make a bunch of enzymes inside this virus that can then uh, destroy ivermectin. This happens in case of bacteria that they develop, they have plasmids that help them destroy penicillin, for example, and that is how the resistance develops. But for viruses to do such kind of things, is, it's very difficult. They have to figure out a bunch of genetic material that would make the, <coughs> excuse me, these kind of enzymes. So not going to happen. And if the virus can actually decide not to send the cargoes, then the virus is going to become neutral anyways. So ivermectin is going to stay in front of this virus for a long time. William has a good question. I know you have said that we don't know the outcome of taking ivermectin for long term. Do you feel bromhexine is also the same or possibly safer for long term prophylaxis? Bromhexine is safer. Although the studies that talk about bromhexine, they say some of them says they, it is useful and some says it is not. <coughs> My thinking is this. Maybe, and again, this is just a conjecture. Maybe some people who have the ADE occurring in them, which is of the type 4 or 5, then presence of bromhexine helps them. And if they do not have that kind of ADE mechanism occurring, then bromhexine doesn't do anything. I'm just thinking aloud. But yes, bromhexine is relatively safer because it has been given to so many patients on chronic basis compared to um, ivermectin. And again, ivermectin may be safe. We just do not know how we haven't given this in this kind of therapy for longer period of times. Margaret McInnes, thank you very much. You are bl brilliant as well, Margaret. Um, Jenna says, I was refused that treatment at onset by three different doctors here. That's just, I think it is necessary for doctors to educate themselves. What I am seeing is that when I share these things with the doctors, they just laugh at it. They simply think it's a, some nut job, um, just talking conspiracy theories. <laughs> so uh, one molecule of ivermectin takes on one single virus. Uh, 1x2, not necessary. For example, here, if you're looking at this uh, drawing, there can be many viruses sitting here that are using this, uh, this uh, importing alpha and beta. Imagine, so instead of calling it importing alpha beta as one donkey, imagine it's a, it is a train. And or there are many, many donkeys that are being used by many, many viruses. And ivermectin can block those donkeys. So it is not one on one combat. It is mostly that there are a bunch of donkeys standing and virus wants to use them. And, and there may be many viruses that want to use them. And ivermectin is just blocking the usage. Victoria, all of the uh, videos that I've done, including today's video, every study that I have referred in the video is uh, referred uh, or the link is present in the description. So if you go to the appropriate um, video in the description, you would see the links. Cool. So there's one more question, uh, maybe Friday, maybe on Friday, but let me just read it. Uh, William says, question, maybe on Friday, when you have time, would you be able to do a quick drawing on how bromhexin blocks the mechanism 
for ADE. I still can't seem to wrap my head around it. Absolutely. So let's see. Um, let me let me do it tomorrow. Just please remind me tomorrow. I would have opened the other artwork that I made and gone on to the exact method and said, here is how it works. So I'll, I'll show it to you tomorrow. Cool. So uh, once again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, please like, subscribe, and share. There is a link to buy me coffees. And there is another link in the description to support my work if you like it. And I would see you tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.